everybody, welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. Today's episode features CLSA strategist Nicholas Smith, who is ranked number one for Japan strategy in Asia Money's Brokers Poll 8 years running, since 2013. Nicholas has been in Japan since 1987, and has been covering Japanese equities since 1990. He first came to Japan as British Universities and Royal Navy and Royal Marines Judo Champion, before joining Jardine Fleming Securities in the tumult of 1990. During his 10 years there, he ranked number one in the chemicals and oil sector and was head of the global oil and chemicals team. He then worked for four years in hedge funds, making investments across all sectors. Nicholas joined CLSA in 2011. And now, please welcome Nicholas Smith. Japan strategist at CLSA in Tokyo, who will share his perspectives on the Japanese markets. Hi Nick, how are you? Hello there, thanks for having me. That's a yawn at the end of the earnings season. (laughs) Um, We saw you on CNBC yesterday, so the headline for this podcast also has been made already. Japan is still cheap was the headline, I think. I think it was, yeah. So why is it so cheap? I think the trouble we've had with the Japanese market is that foreigners have been selling it off since the first week of June 2015. So they've sold off, I forget the precise number, but about $240 billion, which is a very, very big number. They got excited at the beginning of Vabenomics. They thought, yeah, we're going to do some quantitative easing. We've seen that movie before. We know how it ends. So the strangest thing is, if you run foreign buying in the market against their corporate profits, initially they both go up together, but then uh, foreigners start selling and profits keep on going up. So they clearly got bored with something. And the thing that amazed me was if you run that against BOJ's buying of bonds, then the, the two charts just sit straight on top of each other. And I was stunned with this. I mean, a client had asked me, can you update numbers of BOJ buying? And I yawned a bit and thought, God, what a boring thing to be doing. Everyone knows that's a dead story. And then I looked at the chart and went, oh my goodness, I, I know this chart before. I, I know what's going to, to sit on top of that. So now we don't have a story for Japan anymore. And I would have thought that people should be interested in profits. I mean, isn't that what we're here for? But that hasn't been enough for them. That, I think, is the problem. And you saw a couple of days ago, Adia, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, was closing down its uh, Japanese investment team. And they say they want to look for places with bigger growth. And this always confuses me, is to say, well, the strongest period of uh, GDP growth in Japan was the 1960s, during which time the market, 60 through 67, the market went absolutely sideways, while the GDP growth was literally 10, 12% a year. And so GDP growth and market growth don't seem to go together. In fact, I saw one study by LSE which was showing actually they're slightly negatively correlated looking back at 120 years of, of 20 countries data. But that's where we are at the moment. I mean, people get very excited about uh, GDP and they say, well, we must invest in places with fast GDP growth. And I don't think that's what the market's about at all. The market is about finding mispriced assets, which I think we've very definitely got in Japan. And so it's the foreigners sold basically to kuroda san at the BOG. That's what we're seeing. That doesn't actually work as well as you think it does. So the BOJ buys ETFs. And in order that they can do that, then someone's got to create the things, which is very often the trust banks. The trust banks buy stocks to put in the ETFs to back the ETFs, but then they need to do something to raise their return on those uh, stocks. So they lend them out to hedge funds. And so the strangest thing is, that you can hear people talking about this and they say, well, you know, Kuroda's bought and buried all these stocks. You say, no, actually, there's a reason they're counted as, as part of free float. It's actually, they're out for lending to hedge funds who use them to short sell the market. And so I went through the rather dull job of calculating exactly what the BOJ must own. And the stocks that it de facto owns the most of are now most heavily traded stocks in the market. So it hasn't squeezed out liquidity on the things to drive share prices up, exactly the opposite, which is completely counterintuitive. But the result is it doesn't actually do terribly much for the market. And you run that alongside one other thing, which is saying, actually, over the period that Kuroda has been at the the Bank of Japan since April of, of 2013, the valuations of Japanese stocks have gone down, not up. 
So all those trillions of yen worth of BOJ buyings of stocks have gone along with valuations going down, not up. So it clearly hasn't done what it said on the wrapper. That's a fascinating insight. Super interesting. I went back to some of my notes from the fabulous CLSA forum in May and in Mr. Seagram's presentation, there was a note showing a way how the BOJ ultimately could get rid of and divest itself from the five and a half or maybe now 6% of the stock market it owns in ETFs, which said that they should do an ETF and they should basically make that available to the Japanese population and then make it tax-free on inheritance tax. Ultimately, that then creates an incentive for private investors in the Japanese stock market. That was a fascinating idea. It's an interesting idea. I mean, another thing they could do is, is sell off their stocks to the government pension fund, which I think is somewhat light on equities generally. But equities are different from bonds. I mean, a bond has a sort of use-by date, and at the end of a 10-year bond, it's uh, deemed, whereas that's not the case with equities. So you don't actually have any time pressure on them at all. And so you say, well, what's the BOJ going to do? It's not getting a return on it. So, well, it did buy them with money that had created out of nothing. A lot of voters find that difficult to understand, and they say, sort of, what are you doing with my money? And sort of go, it's imaginary money. It doesn't really hurt you. It's equivalent to clipping the outside off a gold coin. Theoretically, it reduces the worth of other notes. And yet, if that were the case, well, we would have had inflation by then, and we haven't had any at all. Ultimately, every central bank has been printing money like crazy. And some people would argue that we had a decoupling of the stock market and the real economy, maybe for some other markets. As you said, the PE in Japan has actually been trending down. So it's still a mystery why it didn't take off in any meaningful way here. Japan's actually got a QE story going back to 94, 95. And an old colleague of mine from Jardine Fleming's, Richard Werner, he wrote a book on the princes of the yen. And he was the guy that, that originally came up with the, the idea of quantitative easing. The, the words quantitative easing are words that he created, or rather, he said, and how are we going to translate that into English? Well, let's call it quantitative easing. He was rather worried about the idea of just printing money. And so I remember writing about that right at the fourth quarter of 2012 and saying, well, my experience of working with Richard Werner is this isn't going to work. It's, it's basically like filling the bath with a plug out. It's not actually going to change anything. I'm getting a little bit technical. What you're doing is printing all this money, but the velocity of the, the money keeps on going down. And so really, I think what quantitative easing really does is when it works, basically what you're doing is you're taking toxic assets off the banks and putting them on the balance sheet of the, uh, the Bank of Japan. And, and that allows the banks to get on and do what they do, which is was lend money. And this business about the Bank of Japan buying all sorts of other assets is a nice idea, but lowering interest rates has nowhere in any market managed to result in accelerating GDP growth. It's a lovely idea, but the idea that lower rates accelerates the economy is something that economists have treated as, as axiomatic without actually testing that it really works, which is, this is the difference that I always find frustrating between economists and scientists. I'm a physicist by training and say, look, if we get something wrong, if one particle goes in the wrong place in CERN, then 300 years of physics go out the window. But with economics, they just keep on saying, well, it, it ought to work. So, well, in this case, it hasn't. Just standardize the assumption and everything is a perfect market. Everything is priced in, which couldn't be further removed from the real world. No, we're talking about people. And so people are very complicated things. They do things for sort of non-scientific reasons. And very often we know that it's wrong and we do it anyway. But you look at the equations of economists and say, that is your equation. That's an equation. I mean, we're doing more complicated equations in, in science when we were at elementary school. And you think that this equation is going to describe the activities of human beings? I, th I think probably not. Part of being dirt cheap is that uh, half of the stocks trade below book value. Some of them probably for a good reason, but I assume you have some quality that you're spotting there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the simpler way of looking at it is just to say, well, broadly half of companies trade below tangible book. 
I mean, tangible books, the sort of hard number, the kind of things that you can stub a toe on, like uh, buildings, property, and, and so on. In some cases, it's a useful number. If you're a real estate company, or, or I've been talking about retailers, for example, and saying, well, you know, Don Quixote bought a number of retailers for their property. And I remember going along to one department store in 2006, 2007, and the foreigners had this idea that uh, all you do is you persuade the department store to sell off its real estate and lease it back. And the person at the department store made me feel like a complete moron. He was going, sorry, really? We would sell off this real estate and then what we would pay as rent in the real market is so much more than we could ever get back through what we sell. So essentially, they're working as if the real estate cost next to nothing because they bought it immediately after the war. Really, they are worth more dead than alive. Their puning department store business does not cover the costs of the real estate. That's why Don Quixote was buying companies because they're saying, well, it'd be much easier to buy their real estate on the stock market than in the real estate market because realtors understand the value of these things and clearly equity people don't. Some of the other things you'll find, so a lot of companies that are trading below book, they're trading below book because they don't cover their cost of capital. And it's a bit like a person who's died all of their photograph albums and books and so on that are incredibly valuable to them, but they're not of any value to anybody else. And so companies are trading below book because they're not really worth anything. The value of their ability to produce buggy whips disappears once we move to autos from a horse market. The other thing you can find on the stock market is companies on negative enterprise value. That's to say, well, generally, that means that they've got cash that's worth more than their market cap. So it's like your eye wandering into a supermarket and find that we go along to the wine counter and they've got cash back coupons that are worth more than the sticker price. And so we can walk off with the booze and be paid for walking away with it. And that's a thing you don't get really outside Japan. Korea is another place where you get it to a certain amount, but uh, it shows that the market is not pricing in the possibility of these companies being bought out. And they weren't getting bought out until the beginning of 2018. Now we have the beginnings of the market for corporate control, and then the whole underpricing starts to change. Since 2018, we've seen some quote-unquote hostile takeovers, and quote-unquote because some of them were still more or less from friendly groups, but at least these were somewhat properly executed by Western capital market standards? From the beginning of 2019, you can run the numbers back for a few decades, and essentially until 2018, the value of these things was literally tens of millions of dollars for all of the hostile takeovers. And sort of go, that's pocket change. It's tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, billions in the US, but not in Japan. And then all of a sudden, a few cases went through. So I think Unizo was effectively a, a hostile takeover. And then when Torshba wanted to take out Nuflair, then Hoya turns up and said, well, we'll put in a higher offer. And Hoya is, of course, the bluest of blue chips. So from that point on, you're going, well, if they can do it, anyone can do it. But we've always looked at hostile takeovers, looked at the private equity as Hagetaka, as vulture funds in Japan. But then over these last two years, we've had MBOs, management buyouts. And from then on in, you're sort of going, well, if the managers are trying to buy out the company, how are they any different? from the private equity that wants to buy out the company. So now we have a sort of a moral level playing field and no one is any more virtuous than anywhere else. And that is what really gets the whole market for corporate control moving. And sometimes we've seen action as a result of activist behavior, but in the opposite direction. I'm thinking of Sony Financial. So they had activists standing in front of their door and saying you should spin Sony Financial off then they bought it in instead. But given that Japan is the market with the largest cross shareholdings or subsidiary listings, that all of this is just good to clean up the market further? Sure. I mean, obviously, Japan's not the only market with cross shareholdings. And Germany was another example of that uh, having existed, although tax changes wiped out a lot of that at the beginning of the noughties. But we've got a very odd situation of listed subsidiaries. One listed company owns a controlling share in another listed subsidiary. In any other market, that's a legal ticking time bomb, as ultimately someone is going to show that you are picking the pockets of minority shareholders. And strangely enough, in Japan, you are able to control a company. With, but we've had big problems with that recently. I mean, obviously, Nissan was a good example of that, that Luno thought that it controlled it with, I can't remember, 40, 43% shareholding. And in the end, it couldn't. 
And there were big problems with one of the oil companies, Idemitsu, where the management decided they wanted to buy out a shore shell in Japan. The founding family had a blocking stake and said, we won't let you do this. And so they sort of diluted the founding family off the face of the earth. And then when it went to the courts, the court said, well, it was clear that diluting the founding family was one of the reasons, but you can't legally prove that it was the main reason that you did the equity issuance and therefore we'll allow it to go ahead. And I think most people looked at that when this is outrageous. Essentially, you're saying that anybody can dilute any shareholders that they don't like. And that makes the whole parent-child thing dangerous. It's not a sustainable model. So a lot of the parents are starting to buy in the subsidiaries. So if you pick the right child and you play the game of waiting for the buyout, you have some probability of success there. That can be a profitable strategy for the Japanese market. I mean, theoretically, if you take all these things, you make a big database, as I've done, of, of all of the cases, and it, it, is, it becomes a big database, then, you know, over the last few years, there's been a uh, sort of broadly a 30% premium for corporate control. And then we've had a, a case recently where the parents said, actually, we're not going to, to buy it in after all, and the share price collapsed. And so rather than sort of sitting there and saying, it doesn't matter whether it's the parent or somebody else that buys it out, there'll be a 30% premium for corporate control. All of a sudden, that model's kind of, you know, the, the wheels are falling off. A similar story was expected from the regional banks to some extent, the restructuring and possible consolidation, and that seemed to have been priced in quite a bit as well, and so far hasn't really materialized. So is there a risk of that premium unwinding as well? Well, the banking business has been a license to burn money for decades. So if you look at the topics, banks index, it peaks against topics in 1987, back end of 1987, if I remember correctly. Uh, so I, I think Tiger had been short of the banks industry and they said, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Within that, you've got the regional banks. They are the most ragged of the bank, real challenge of trying to cover costs there. So lending spreads are, are so wafer thin now that, uh, that it's really tough. And basically, there are too many of them. Some people say, good, so with those comments from Suga, then it's open season for activists. because there, there are a number of them that have got some interesting crown jewel assets. I've been arguing, please, I wouldn't recommend that they will need those crown jewels to make themselves look attractive to a potential bank acquirer. The right thing for them to do is not give a special dividend or a share buyback to make a one-off profit for some foreign activist fund. But the risk is, and we've seen a lot of cases of this, that they just slowly die over time. So you could say, well, we'll put a few of them together. And, and that reminds you of the old saying that you can tie two bricks together, but it won't make them float. So the other thing you've probably been asked a hundred times as well was when Warren Buffett invested $5 billion into the trading companies and everybody was scratching their head and trying to decipher the meaning behind that. What was your take? Yeah, I mean, obviously you look at the things and you say return on equity, five-year return on equity lower than cost of equity, return invested capital lower than whack, not really a Buffett kind of thing. And then you look at the number of listed subsidiaries and you go, wow, you know, we're, we're talking about equity holdings in one case of over 180. So Buffett's comment about, I like to buy simple companies, so that shouldn't be on your shopping list then. They're paying a decent dividend. So I, as I remember, it was about four and three quarter percent dividend yield and Buffett's cost of debt to buy them was about two thirds of a percent. So sure, he's making a spread, but this isn't the kind of returns that you know, 20% a year plus returns that made Buffett famous and the point a billionaire. So really what it's about is basically any M&A deal gets shown to them first. And Japan's trading companies are an enormous source of information. I remember many moons ago when I was global chemical analyst and I'd visit companies in Asia and say, you know, what are the Chinese doing? And I remember one guy had looked at me and went, sorry, you're asking me what the Chinese companies are doing. When I want to know what's happening in my country, I go and ask the Japanese trading companies, which really brought home to me the extent to which they seem to have finger on the, a lot of pulses that really understand what's going on in markets. So in a way, the relationship with the, uh, the trading companies is to get a look at, at all the deals. They see deal flow and Buffett is struggling to find deals and probably that's what he's after. That's why... 
he split his investment. When what are we talking? Five, six billion dollars, which for, for him is is not a big investment. And he split it between half a dozen companies instead of one, which means to say, I want to look at all of their deal flows. The valuations on it were fantastic. I really like this company. He would have picked one. So that's a price for information these days. <laughs> well, yes, probably more than you or I could uh, afford. <laughs> Lots of excitement in Japan, of course. We've got a new administration. We've got changes that happened in a short time from the pandemic. What are the sectors that you like going forward? It's a tough day to be asking that question. I mean, I think for the last couple of years, my model portfolio has done very nicely. Thank you in staying away from value investments and just buying quality. And you justify it to yourself and say, well, when money costs slightly less than nothing, then I can afford to pay up for quality. And that's been definitely the thing. When we went into the plague, then people were saying, I want something that's just going to keep ticking away. I don't want to deal with the massive uh, cyclical downturn and then the recovery. I want something that is pretty much bomb-proof and I don't mind paying up for it. Now we've got a story about perhaps having a vaccine, and it's still very early days. But if we've got a vaccine, then all sorts of things change. And you can see the stock market is going absolutely nuts today. So a lot of low quality stuff is shooting up and a lot of stuff that's done very well is coming off. Mostly what we're seeing is short covering. I'm still doing very nicely today on stuff like recruitment companies. So I keep reminding people. One of the first reports I wrote at this company was called Japan's Perfect Demographics. So a lot of people complain about Japan and say, well, it's got a shrinking population. And my reply is, so what's wrong with the shrinking population? Wasn't there a reason why China had a one-child policy? Really, we've not been running around saying, I wish we had more people. In a world of AI and, uh, and robotics, then population growth is not a good thing. And this is where we're getting Trumpism from, is saying other people are taking our jobs off us. Japan is different because they're down on bended knee, praying that they can come up with technologies that will take the jobs off people. And that makes Japan all more interesting from an AI and robotics point of view. So, you know, companies like Fanuc, of course, are, are interesting in that regard. Japan has got some of the world's best robotics makers. But actually, the job market is tight. Even now, we've got job to applicant at more than one. There are more job openings than there are applicants. That's kind of interesting. So once we come out of this downturn, then all of a sudden companies will be looking for sort of battle casualty replacements, all those people that have retired over that period. And I think working age population is down about 420,000 over the last year. That's why we've got such a, a tight job market. Technology generally is looking good. Recruitment companies are looking good. I've got some real estate, particularly related to an activist fund, her strategic capital is uh, tightening the screws on Kei Hanshin, for example. So those are some of the areas that I've been looking at. So many industries are dominated by an oligopoly, of course. It sometimes takes an outsider to shake things up. And when you look at the telcos, you've got now Rakuten launching their big campaign, 3 million free subscriptions for the first year. Plus, you've got Suga-san saying you need to lower your mobile phone fees. Is that going to have a meaningful impact on the telcos? That's moot too, isn't it? Japanese prime ministers have not been long-lived. Post-war, the life expectancy of a prime minister is about 26 months. And so the people say Abe is, is the longest-lived prime minister of the post-war period. You go, really? Because pre-war, it was even shorter time. It was about 14 months. Obviously, Suga has got to move fast to make himself attractive. Don't underestimate this man. He is very impressive. There's a lot of people out there saying he'll only last a year. I don't think so. There's no one in the LDP that is even close in terms of votability. One of the things he wants to do is if he says, well, I can bring down mobile phone prices, then a lot of people will say that's, gonna, <laughs> that's one of my biggest costs. But maybe as long as he can say, well, I gave you a Rakuten, didn't exist, now it does, it sells them very cheaply. And so I gave you a cheap option. It might not have all the bells and whistles, but I've given you the cheap option. If he can deliver that, that's probably enough. I don't think what he wants to do is crush the Japanese telco sector any further. Final question. 
But I'll say, so the last time we spoke, we talked about all these cryptocurrency stuff. And you also mentioned that you've been through all the, and there are many of them, central bank white papers on digital currencies, central bank digital currencies. What is your take? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, on the face of it, the central banks are saying what we want to do is as paper money uh, starts to disappear, we've got to produce uh, options and we're going to give them digital currencies instead. And our fear is that there's a lot more to it than that. They would like to squeeze out paper money, partly give more information about what people are doing with their money. And you'd be particularly worried about that if you're uh, in a centrally planned regime. But anywhere, we don't want the government to know all of where our money is going not because we're doing something naughty, but because it's none of their damn business. The other thing I think is that central banks want to use it to put uh, interest rates plus or minus on cash. And I am not sure that I'm very happy with them doing that. There are other interesting parts of it. Obviously, when we had the virus first hit, then governments wanted to put money into people's bank accounts. And in Japan, that was a complete mess because the government that taxes us doesn't know what we earn because we don't have an identifying number. And so my number that about 20% of Japanese people have, they want to roll it out and then they want to be able to put money into the hands of the needy. Whereas with this particular case, the UK, for example, was able to do that. They put it straight into people's bank accounts and Japan went, well, we, we don't know the numbers or the neediness of anybody. So we'll just give a smaller amount of money to everybody, which was a mess. Having a real-time pulse on all the economic information, all the activity that's actually going on would be a good thing. Increasingly, people are coming around to the idea and say, GDP used to be a useful number. It's harder and harder to use it now, and it's got less meaning. People make far too much fuss about GDP for Japan in my business, and Japan is a function of global growth rather than local growth. I tie stocks much more to global trade than to local GDP. So I just have to keep reminding people, say, well, I can't buy a piece of GDP. I can only buy a piece of a company. That's what we do for a living. So GDP is not really that interesting. Thank you very much, Nick. Great insights into the Japanese market. And we'll see. Do you have targets already for the end of 2021? I think you can work off valuations to suggest 15% upside to the, the market easily from here. All right. Knock on wood. Thank you very much and have a good end of the year. Thanks for taking the time. Great to speak to you. Thanks for having me.